Thanks be to God. I'm not exactly sure why this, how this came about, but Jason and I love to do our grocery shopping together. I know. I'm not exactly sure why this happens. We kind of like to go to the grocery store, plan what we're going to eat, who likes what. We're getting texts from all the kids, what chips they want and all that. It's just kind of a, it's an event for us. But I have standards as to what groceries I will and will not buy. Cookies at my house are made from scratch. <laughs> it's just a thing with me. Nestle Toll House cookies with one tiny little all alteration to the recipe made with love. That is my standard in cookies. So one day we were at the grocery store and Jason reached over to buy one of those like plastic wrapped logs of what they call cookie dough. And I looked at him and I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I, I don't know. I thought I'd just get some cookie dough. And I said, I don't know. I don't know if this is going to work out. <laughs> Because everyone knows that homemade is best. Homemade is best. So this line, this thing that Jesus says to his disciples who are questioning him about God in God's triune fullness, making a home, means home made. To me. It's just stuck with me all week. This morning's sermon is called Home Made, and it's the first and I guess what you could call a series of sermons. I get to do two in a row <laughs> because our passages this week and next week have in common a theme around homes and households. This week, home made, and next week, household. Today's scriptures have in common this home, house theme, and especially where hospitality is. Our call to worship comes to us from the New Jerusalem, God's home. We see Lydia practicing this radical hospitality immediately after becoming a believer. And then Jesus in the gospel tells us, I'm moving in. The Gospels and the readings and the scriptures today have this make yourself at home or mi casa, su casa kind of ethos, and I love it. Lydia prevailing upon Paul and presumably Timothy and possibly Luke and who else, who knows who else makes up this we party that's going to stay with her at her home. It's paired with Jesus saying something remarkable. I believe it. we overlook it. We don't give enough emphasis to it. And we will come to them and make our home with them. Today we're going to ask ourselves as we interact with these readings, how do we invite Jesus in? What happens when we open the doors of our home to Jesus? When he makes his home with us, when our homes and our lives become home made. So first, let us consider Lydia. I love this woman. (laughs) She's a businesswoman. She makes her living dealing in purple goods, probably cloth. That's why the kids got purple cloth in their worship bags today. This means she's in frequent contact with people who are wealthy and of high station. Those are the people who buy something like purple cloth. She is single. Interesting to note no husband mentioned in this passage. So that probably means demographically she's more likely widowed than she is divorced or never married. She's in Philippi, not from there. Philippi is very polytheistic, temples to hundreds of different gods, cults and everything else. Um, Even archaeology tells us there's no synagogue in Philippi. So She's at a place of prayer. Get out of there. Don't go into these false god temples. Go to the river. That's where you find God. There she is. She becomes a convert. She hears the good news. 
Luke is careful to tell us four things. Four things we're going to consider today about this Lydia interaction. First, that the Lord opened her heart. The Lord opened her heart. Second, she was an eager listener, eager to listen to what Paul had to say about Jesus being the Messiah. Third, she was baptized, but not alone. Baptized with her entire household. And four, her response to her newfound faith was to open her home. To open her home and to support the new church financially. So let's look at each one of these things. Firstly, the scripture tells us the Lord opened her heart. Well, this is exactly what Mitch preached last week, right? It's God that makes a person's heart able to receive the truth of the gospel. It's not the work of the person proclaiming the good news. It's the work of the Spirit in that holy ground between Paul's mouth and Lydia's ears. It hasn't changed. God opens hearts. An open heart is, by definition, hospitable. An hospitable heart to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think this is what we all desire for ourselves and for others. I hope it is. But try as we may, we are powerless, powerless to open hearts on our own. We need God. We need God to do what God does. God acts on behalf of us, though, when we pray. That is the power that we do have. We know this to be true. We have to pray. We have to pray for God to give us and everyone else, please, Jesus, everyone else, hospitable, open hearts, able to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. The second thing, to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. Open heart, eager listening. I love this idea of eager listening. When was the last time you were eager to hear good news, or any kind of news, but even good news, that would radically change the way you live your life. When was the last time you were eager to hear news that would change who you are and how you interact with the world? We desire, at least I hope and pray, we desire open hearts and open ears to the good news that Jesus Christ is alive and changing everything and everyone. But are our ears as open as our hearts are? If the Spirit is given free reign in us, if we're willing to change, willing to give up control over our lives and our resources, ouch, then yes. But if we stop somewhere short, if our ears only hear what we want to hear about Jesus and the way of Jesus, then we have some more praying to do. We've got to pray not only for open hearts, but also for open ears, hospitable and eager to hear the good news. Thirdly, she and her household were baptized. I love this. Open hearts and eager ears result in public transformation. Everyone notices when you get dunked in a river, it's a public transformation. And this is not the first time we're going to hear of an entire household being baptized because of the newfound faith of one of the members in the household. Lydia chooses to be baptized and uses this influence that she has over the members of her household to turn her baptism into a contagious event. Contagious. She's a super spreader. Faith is something that families pass along to one another. When one person in a household gets infected with this Jesus bug, so does everybody else. This is good news. They just can't help it. Hallelujah, right? Contagious faith. Number four, she urged us, saying, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. She prevailed upon us. I love this. She's got influence. She's got power. She's got a voice. 
and she is heard. So many times we think that women in biblical times couldn't exercise any influence or power. They did, and they could. And she did. To the point of insistence. The presence of Jesus in our hearts prompts us to invite others in. And to dedicate everything we have and everything we are to inviting more people in. Hearts hospitable to the gospel, ears eager to hear the good news that will change everything, public transformation, contagious faith, inviting others in. This is the legacy of Lydia. And thanks be to God for that. Our gospel reading this morning from John follows some similar tracks. The opening verse of our passage today begins with an answer to a question. The reading didn't begin with the question, which I think is a little odd, so I'm going to give it to you now. The question is, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. How lovely. Jesus reveals himself to those who love him. And the way he knows we love him is by our keeping of his word, which of course is not his, but his father's who sent him. So, Hearts that are hospitable to God's word, which is not only the writings, like, yes, the word of the Lord is the law and the prophets, the actual words, the scriptures. Yes, that. But also, the word, capital W, of God in the flesh, Jesus himself. These are hearts of people who love Jesus. We love by Keeping, and there's a two-prong idea but this word to keep, right? It's both holding on to something, keeping it, guarding it, treasuring it, keeping it, but also living up to it. Living up to the word is keeping the word, keeping the commands, holding on to and living up to God's word. To keep it, though, we have to have open hearts and open ears, don't we? And then that's something. When we begin to keep the word, something almost imaginable, almost unimaginable happens to us. Jesus and the Father, along with the promised Holy Spirit, make their home with us. They move in. What a crazy thought. Just take a moment. The creator of all that is, the redeemer of all that is wrong, the giver of all breath and faith, taking up residence in us and in our homes. This is how Jesus says he reveals himself to those of us who love him. Loving Jesus. Let's talk about that for a second. I recently got to stay in the home of a dear friend of mine. I got to revisit an old friendship, and it was, it was a great day. This friend of mine knew me when I lived somewhere else, where I was busy having and raising babies like everyone else around me at the time. I was nowhere near the point in my life where I would be breaking molds and going to seminary and answering wild calls to ministry in my life. And so she was so curious. She was so curious. What happened to you? <laughs> so curious about my life. She really wanted to know what, what, what happened? And I told her, you know, I really can't remember a time in my life that I didn't feel close to God. Since the time I was one of these tiny little children, I was close to God, and I felt Jesus just as real as anything else in my life. I've always had a closeness. I'm blessed that way. It's a gift. It's nothing I did. It's just true. 
And she said, tell me about that, because I, how do you love someone that isn't really there? How do you love someone like that, that you don't really know? And I said, well, and I had never, it was the spirit in that moment. I said, well, it's a lot like expecting a baby. There's this person that you love so fiercely you haven't seen but is indwelling you. And you love that person so much and suddenly then they arrive in your home. <laughs> they move in. I remember so intently and I told her this. I said, I remember like it was yesterday, a conversation that I had with my second born when he was a newborn. I held his little, hand, his little head right here and his feet just kind of cur curled up this way because he was just tiny. And I remember holding him like this and saying, hi, who are you and what do you like? I would have this conversation with him. Because here he was, this person that I loved so fiercely, I would gladly die to protect him. But I hardly knew him. This love that we have for Jesus is a lot like that. It's a lot like loving our newborn children. They live in us. They are a part of us. They are, at the same time, strangely, a little bit unknown to us until they move into our homes and turn our worlds upside down and rearrange our priorities drastically. <laughs> yes? They give us someone not only to live for, but someone we would gladly die for. And the longer they live with us, the better we come to know them and begin to recognize them for exactly who they are. Let the church say, come, Lord Jesus, quickly come. Homemade is best. A home made with the triune God is best. Hearts hospitable to the good news of Jesus Christ's resurrection and reign. Ears open to the word both written and embodied. Love for Jesus demonstrated by the keeping of the way. Super spreader infectious faith inviting others in. This is homemade. This is best. Let it be so. Amen.